This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. This episode of the podcast was recorded during my visit to Zurich, Switzerland, where I had the opportunity to spend an hour with Jungian analyst, author, editor, publisher, and lecturer, Murray Stein. Dr. Stein earned a Master of Divinity from Yale University in 1969, a Diploma in Analytical Psychology, which is the degree of a Jungian analyst, from the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich in 1973, and a Ph.D. in Religion and Psychological Studies from the University of Chicago in 1984. He's been a member of the International Association for Analytical Psychology, the IAAP, since 1973 and served as its president from 2001 to 2004. He was an honorary member of the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago from 1976 to 2003, the founding member and first president of the Chicago Society of Jungian Analysts, and one of the founding members of North America's Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts. Since 2003, Dr. Stein has been both a training and supervising analyst at the International School of Analytical Psychology in Zurich, where he served as president from 2008 to 2012, as well as a member of the Swiss Society for Analytical Psychology located in Bern, Switzerland. In addition, Dr. Stein was editor and publisher at Chiron Publications from 1983 to 2014. This interview was recorded on the morning of November 25th, 2015, in Dr. Stein's office in the historic building known as the Solomon Gessner House, just down the street from Grossmunster Church. Dr. Stein told me that Goethe had visited Solomon Gessner in the house, and that Mozart had played his violin there at the age of 10 when he and his father were passing through Zurich on a European tour. We had only a short amount of time together, so we had to sort of hit the ground running, and we begin here with Dr. Stein in mid-sentence. I believe I had asked him to talk about his response to current world events, looked at from a Jungian perspective. Whatever they do in the name of their religion is justified. You know, it's incredible. But in certain situations, when people become... Uh, convinced that they have the truth, they can do anything. Hitler was one of them. You have a vision, you have a moment of insight that tells you, now I have the answer, and that answer can come from an established religion, it can come from a numinous experience, Um, and you're touching an archetype. So the religions are based on an archetypal ground, when you get deeply into them and you screen out the rest of the world and you touch those spots, it becomes extremely convincing and not to be discussed. Uh, my friend Luigi Zoya, who was uh, just before me the president of the IAP, has just finished writing a book on paranoia, uh, the psychological illness that changes history, I think he calls it. And he discusses this problem as at the foundation of paranoia is uh, an absolute truth. You Mm -hmm. know what the answers are before anybody can tell you, okay? So before anybody can say anything, you already know who they are. You know what they are intending. And we call this projection, of course. Uh, So they're the enemy, and you displace all of your um, madness and aggression or whatever onto them and then attack them. And unfortunately, this has an archetypal ground. You know, so Jungians can explain it, and this is the dark side of that whole program that was launched by Joseph Campbell to find your personal myth. If you do that naively and you find your myth, you become almost inhuman. You know, I mean, maybe you can find a few people who agree with your myth or who fit into the picture, but... Uh, What Jung gave us was a theory that explains this and tells you how to deal with it. And how you deal with it is not to identify with it. If you identify with these archetypal energies and and images, you become an extremist. And anything goes. You can do anything. Now, ISIS has an answer, 
Okay, it's grounded in a tradition in Islam. They can quote the Quran for up one side and down the other. They're extremely intelligent, the leaders. These are not stupid people you're mm -hmm. dealing with. These are people who have outwitted all Western intelligence. They, they know where to strike. They know when to strike. Uh, they're extremely clever and they are grounded in a myth. They have a myth. They can answer all your questions. When will the world end? They want the world to end in 2016 or 17. They have a, a, a prophecy. That will be the end of the world and the Mahdi will come and Jesus will return. And so if they can draw all the powers of the world to the Middle East and get them to fight with each other, as you saw just on the brink yesterday with Turkey shooting down this airplane, if Russia were to attack Turkey in, in retaliation, that would draw in uh, NATO, the United States is a member of NATO, all the European countries, and then you'd have a war between Russia and NATO with atomic bombs flying around all over the place. That's the end of the world scenario. Yeah. That's what they want. And so they'll do anything to provoke that, to draw all the countries to their area because they say it will happen here, it will happen in this area, and it will happen on such and such, by such and such a date. I think they predicted 16 or 17, something like that. And you see it step by step moving in that direction. And you wonder, do they know something? How are they so clever to manage this? You know, and you can start thinking, well, uh, they have a myth. And this myth is grounded in something, you know, it's grounded in an archetypal base. And, uh, somehow they're able to arrange things in such a way that looks like a program is being filled. How can that be? If you look at how World War I started, it was very similar. Mm -hmm. There was a small incident mm -hmm. in Serbia, you know. So Austria attacked. Well, Serbia had an alliance with Russia, so Russia came into it. Well, uh, uh, Germany had an alliance with Austria, so Germany came into it. France and England had an alliance with Russia, so they came into it. And before you know, everybody's at war. From a small incident at a particular spot at a particular time, that's how it starts. And that's why people are so worried here. They see it's a tinderbox. And one match, you know, at the, at the wrong place, at the wrong time, will light it and it will just go up in smoke. So you have tremendous anxiety in Europe. Um, not only because of these terrorist acts in Paris and, and all of that, which is bad enough, but that's worse. Yeah. That's much worse. And um, so in a time like this, and Jung lived in a time like this, when he started his Red Book experience, 1913, it was just on the verge of the First World mm -hmm. War. And he was on a train from Schaffhausen to Zurich. He was visiting his mother-in-law. And on that train, on an afternoon, he had this vision of Europe going up, you know, freezing over, being flooded. And he thought, well, am I going psychotic? You know, the unconscious is overwhelming me. Right. Uh, and so he didn't know what that meant. But people were at that time also very anxious because everybody was increasing their armaments. You know, Germany was very militaristic, Austria. Then the others respond, we have to build up. Like Cameron announced the other day, we have to build up our military too to face this threat. Um, and so you see, it's in the air, and Jung had this vision about a year before it started. Mm -hmm. And then when it started, he was in Scotland when the First World War uh, broke out, and he had to get back to Zurich, and, and it was very difficult. It took him a week or so to get back from Scotland to Switzerland. Uh, he actually felt relieved that it wasn't personal. Oh, so, so I'm not going crazy. The world's going crazy. So this connection between the personal and the collective is also very uh, fundamental to Jungian psychology. Yes. So when we talk about individuation, it isn't just about becoming individuated as an individual. You know, as it isn't individualism that right. separates you from everything. It connects you to everything, yes. but on another level. Mm -hmm. And from that level, you can sometimes get information so that Jungians look at their dreams, you know. Is it an archetypal dream? Well, if it is, you know, maybe it's not about me personally, it's about something else, something bigger. So what is the Jungian solution to this? What can Jungians do about it? Well, 
Jung faced two big cataclysmic events in Europe. He lived in a terrible time, mm -hmm. much worse than our time has sure. been so far. First World War, Second World War. And when in the 30s, when he saw it coming again uh, in Germany, uh, and he said he saw the war coming in the dreams of his patients, in his own you know, wor inner work, and it wasn't a surprise this time. First World War was a total surprise. Nobody thought the world would ever go to war again like that. They thought we're too, we're too smart, we're too rational, we're too uh, uh, cultured and educated for war. Who wants war? That's crazy. And then it happened, so it was a huge surprise. Second World War was no surprise. It was just an extension of the First World War. Yes. And, uh, and what he said about what was going on in Germany in 1936, uh, and you know, people would ask him, what do you think about Germany and so on? He said, it's like you're standing uh, on a volcano and it's erupting and you, the individual can do nothing. It's much more powerful than we are. So what can Jungians possibly do? I had a patient the other day who said, you know, after these attacks in Paris and all that stuff, and, and he listed all the attacks that have happened, 9-11 and Madrid and so on, he said, we've got to do something. Why doesn't somebody stand up and do something? Where's a leader? We need a Churchill. Well, that's what the Germans were saying too. We need a leader. And then oh. one comes along, you know. And I said to him, no, uh, I think that's a dangerous thing to have a leader <laughs> like that anyway. Um, what do Jungians propose in a situation like this? Well, we're small individuals. Even if we'd organize all the Jungians in the world and go, go marching through the streets, we would have no effect whatsoever. Right. You know, these are forces and powers way beyond. So Jung said, we're standing at the edge of a volcano. Look for cover. You know, you can't possibly stop it. Mm -hmm. That's what he saw happening in Germany. No individuals, no matter what I say, no matter anybody else says, it's going to run its course. And we don't know what that course will be. You know, in Europe, until 1942-43, they basically thought Germany was going to rule the world, you know. And then it sort of turned and after Stalingrad and so on, but still it was unclear what was going to happen. So he lived in terrible times. And what he did and what he proposed, and I guess what Jungians would propose today is, um, go inward, follow your own dreams, don't listen to leaders, because the, no matter what a leader proposes, it's going to be wrong. There are yeah. no answers to this. Uh, and listen to your dreams, follow your inner voice, and try to keep sane. You know, try to keep your balance. I had a patient who brought a dream the other day in which she had the task in the dream. She said, this is the strangest dream I ever had. I don't know what it means. But the task was there was a a container, a square container, a red plastic container with water in it. And then somebody put a sort of phallic-like thing in it, a, a, a vase, so, but open at both ends and poured water into that. And so if you lifted that piece up, the water would flow out of the tank, out of the container. So you had to leave that piece in, standing there. And her job was to pick this thing up and move it somewhere. Okay, to carry it and empty the water somewhere else. So she she tried this. She tried to lift it up a little bit. No, the water rises. You can't do that. You have to leave it there. So you have to pick it up very carefully and move very carefully. And she did it in the dream. Mm. And then pour it out very carefully over there. And this task of holding the opposites together, you have a horizontal and a vertical, very delicate. Uh, and that's what every individual has to do somewhere in their life, hold the opposites together. That's what we say, masculine, feminine, up, down, spiritual, physical, all that. And try to carry it, try to hold the tension of the opposites and carry it carefully in your life. Um, and I think if enough individuals did that, and this was Jung's only shred of hope, is when he said the world hangs on a thread, on a tissue, and that tissue is the psyche, because, you know, Putin's pretty crazy. I mean, he may attack Turkey tomorrow with all, all his uh, force. And 
Erdogan in Turkey is is very stubborn man, and he might you know fire back, and then you there you go. And I think Obama's a rational man, but he's also very controlled by other forces, military and Congress and whatnot, and yes. huge political pressures to act, do something. Um, there are no answers in this situation. So if enough people held the opposites, uh, the need to act versus the need to understand, well, you have to have both. Yes, you have to act in some way, but you have to understand the situation also. Uh, the need to uh, hold the opposites of masculine and feminine together, the receptive and the active. Uh, so holding this kind of tension, I think if enough individuals did it, it would have an effect on the collective. But you can't go directly to the collective and tell them what to do. You can't advise President Obama. You can't. You can write letters to the newspaper. You can march in the streets if you want to. But it, it doesn't have any any effect. The most effect you can have is on yourself, and then hope that this will extend to the people you know. You know that gradually over time it will have an effect on the culture. And um, I know Jim Hillman, who I knew years and years ago and worked with and for and struggled with. <laughs> um, he wrote a book called We've Had a Hundred Years of Psychotherapy and the World Isn't Any Better. But I challenge that. I wonder, would the world be worse without it? Ah. Um, you don't know that, of course. But I think a lot of pe people, individuals, have been helped yeah. by psychotherapy of all kinds. And what's different about Jungian psychotherapy, and this I wanted to talk with you a moment about, is that it does... Uh, it. It goes deep. And what do we mean by deep? Well, we mean, you know, according to our theory and the way we see the psyche, it has layers. And, you know, you've got an individual layer, which is very active and, and, um, and based on your own personal life history and your complexes, your wounds, your traumas. Um, and that can be very interfering in your life, and that has to be dealt with and looked at. Mm -hmm. And most psychotherapies sort of work on that level and try to control it with through rationality, through cognitive power, which is very good if you can do it. But sometimes cogn cognition isn't by itself enough. Willpower mm -hmm. isn't strong enough, so you have to go deeper. And we look for help at the deeper levels, not only problems, but resources. And that's the difference between Jungian and Freudian. Jungian, uh, Freudians go deep too, but all they find is problems. They find conflicts. They find, uh, you know, wishes that are incommensurable with the way one can possibly live in a social world. Can't have sex with your mother. Uh, you know, it's out of the question. It just ruled out, but you might want it. So they go deep, but they find problems. Jungians go deep and they start finding solutions. Yes. And the solutions come in the form of symbols. Like this woman symbol, you know, yes. carrying this thing. That offers a solution to a problem at a symbolic level. The symbol doesn't do it by itself, but at least it gives you a hint for how to proceed, yes. you know. This means I have to be a little more careful. I have to be more thoughtful. I have to go slower. I can't just act on my impulses right away, you know. I have to hold the tension. So the dream offers a solution, but it doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem. You have to do something with the dream. And that's what Jung called the ethical step. You know, if you just stay with a dream and you observe it and you paint it and you love it and you think that's a beautiful thing, and then you go on to the next one, uh, it doesn't have very much effect. Right. And some people have lots of great dreams, but it doesn't change them very much. Right. So you have to do something with the dream. And what do we do? Well, we try to think, what uh, what can this dream offer me, and Jung talked about dreams compensate, consciousness yeah. one-sidedness. What does it offer me that I don't, I'm not doing or thinking enough yet, and if I bring that in a little more, my life will go better, mm -hmm. okay? I will be a better person, I'll be a more whole person, and so on. And so we, we think about dreams, and then we try to do something with them. And that ethical step means you try to put it into practice somewhere. You actually use it for mm -hmm. something. So analysis isn't just, uh, uh, you know, sort of observing who you are and discovering who you are, but it's 
looking for solutions that might make a difference in your life. So there's a there's a dynamic uh, uh, aspect to Jungian analysis, and I think. People who have had a good experience in analysis, at least, not everybody does, but the ones who have, uh, testify to that. They say, yeah, it did make a difference in my life. Some people even say it saved my life. What do they mean? They mean, well, they have a better understanding of themselves. They changed some things that made things work better for them in the world and probably helped a lot of other people as a result, too. Yes. So it's not just selfishness. Right. Analysis isn't just about helping yourself. Right. It's about helping the world. Um, now, you know, we can't put the Islamic extremists into analysis because they won't discuss it. So we can't really, uh, they, they won't discuss their, uh, if you could get them to consider their dreams, they might have very peaceful dreams. They might have dreams that show that they're extremists, that, they, that they, they're too one-sided, they're suicidal, a lot of them. I think a lot of them are in terrible despair about this world. You know, they're frustrated, they're angry, they're hurt. And so they lash out and um, they want to change something. And I think we also, and this is another thing that Jungians are trained to do, is to listen to a person's pain and suffering and try to hear through it what is the real problem behind all this. So you get a lot of behavior and a lot of acting out, but what what's behind the suffering? If you can get to that, what is the trauma? What where is the suffering, and work on that? And I think what these people are suffering from is a kind of collective, um, um, cultural uh, inferiority feeling that, and and they compensate by superiority feelings. Right. Okay? But underneath, because the West has all the scientific achievements, all the developments, uh, you know, that you, they look, I mean, what they, they use all the Western technology, mm -hmm. uh, they like Western, uh, fashion and music and so on. And they realize that their culture hasn't kept up and they want to go back to the seventh century and do it like Muhammad did it. Well, that's just, that's a defensive reaction. That's a, you know, it's a, it's what people do when they feel totally unable to adapt to a situation. Okay. They're going to find something that's so different, and then they're going to try to impose it on the other one and say, I'm better than you. But if you can get to their suffering, you know, to their feelings of inferiority and their feelings of inadequacy, um, and work with that and, and, and adjust your system to accommodate that in a way. I heard a lecture a few weeks ago by um, a Jungian analyst from France, uh, and this was before the Paris attacks, but after the, uh, the, fir the first ones in January. And she said, you know, you have to understand that the French educational system is perfectly set up to make people feel stupid and inferior. If you're not a thinking type, if you're not French, if you don't speak the language perfectly, you will feel like an idiot. Mm. And the teachers uh, are trained to uh, humiliate students. Uh, it's, it's really good for brilliant thinking types. Okay. But for the rest, and I've known people who've gone through that system, they feel, end up feeling terrible about themselves because they're not thinking types, they're a feeling type. And so she said the educational system has to change in yes. France. Well, that's a big job, to change a culture to accommodate a different typology, to accommodate a different cultural attitude. America is in a better position to do that because it isn't so fixed. You know, it's much more flexible historically. It has been able to absorb people from many different countries and traditions and languages. And, uh, but these European cultures are very fixed. They have a long history. They have a, a deep identity. And for them to open up and change a little bit is a huge challenge. Sure. You know, they feel lost. They, uh, Switzerland, uh, some years ago, uh, had a, a referendum about, um, you know, the Islamic, uh, people here wanted to build, um, these towers, you know, minarets. And the Swiss voted it down. 
it was a plebiscite. All the people of Switzerland get to vote on things like this, and they voted it down. They don't want that. As they say, we change the look of Switzerland. This is a Christian culture. Uh, our history is Christian. We like the churches and the bells. We don't want minarets and all that. Well, this really offended sure. the Muslims. Now, in a country where, I mean, religion is tolerated here. They, they can practice their religion, but not too loud. Oh. Of course, they feel like second-class citizens. Yeah. See, that's a problem. We've got these beautiful churches with bells. That right down the street here is uh, Grossminster. That's where Zwingli, one of the great reformers, you know, he and Luther and Calvin were the three great leaders of the Reformation. Right down the street, okay. Zwingli. That's Jung's tradition. Ah, His father was yes. a minister in that church, yes. in that tradition, in that uh, denomination. And um, cultures get very um, fixed in their forms. You grow up in that, and that becomes your identity, and you identify with it. And uh, Jung didn't. Uh, and that's the, the genius of Jung, that he, he grew up right in the middle. His grandfather was, was one of the leading Protestant ministers in Switzerland. His father, six uncles who were Protestant ministers. Uh, and, and his family was deeply rooted in this uh, culture. And he just broke the boundaries. He, he was interested in Chinese philosophy. He was interested in Indian mythology and religion. Uh, any religion in the world he was interested in. Mm -hmm. And so and he didn't identify with any of them. He didn't yeah. go to church. But he respected all of them. Yes. He thought they're, they're all, they all have something because they all lead you to the archetypal ground. And if you mm -hmm. can get there and use that, it can be good for your life. Right. You can get good energy from it. But if you identify with it, build these hardened structures, uh, it makes, you know, it, it, it isolates you. So um, Jungians re tend to respect religion, um, and a lot of them practice certain religious traditions even. But I think most are, are kind of free of religious traditions as such, even if they might participate to some extent. And are open to the movement of the spirit wherever it comes from. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a kind of openness to the spiritual. And I recently wrote a book, of which I will give you a copy. Uh, I have that. I just bought oh, that. I brought yeah, it okay. with me for you to sign. Oh, good. The idea behind this book is uh, what I've been talking about, that for uh, the Jungian approach to, um, to spirituality is to stay open to... Uh, what the unconscious offers, yes. and to look at it, and to relate to it, and to respect it, and and to make it conscious, to bring it more and more into consciousness. So that's what I call minding the self, in the sense of like minding your business, mm -hmm. taking care of your your own personal things, uh, but also bringing it from an unconscious to a more conscious position, and uh, bringing it into mind and mindfulness. You know observing what your psyche is doing and, yeah. and taking care of it and respecting it. And it will lead you then. You know, it will lead you where you need to go. You get a sense of destiny from it. You get a sense of direction. Such a simple thing as just paying attention to your dreams grounds you in yourself. Mm -hmm. it, it makes you much more at home in yourself. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. Uh, you don't even have to interpret them. Just... Write them down, tell them to somebody, discuss them with your husband at breakfast or something. But keep them with you and carry them through the day and you will stay in touch with yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and you will be able to use them after a while. So uh, it's, it's an approach to life I call minding the self and it gradually increases your capacities to empathize with other people to love yourself as well as others, you know, to accept yourself, your shadow side, your various parts. You wanted to talk about Jung and Zurich. Yes. Well, you're sitting in the home of Jungian psychology. It's source. It's, yes. it's roots are here. And you were at the Psychological Club yesterday with mm -hmm. Andreas Reitz, I understand. And uh, that's where Jung began his teaching, you know, in that, in that room that you saw there. Uh, Zurich is, is like the Mecca for Jungians in the sense that it started here and it continues to live here and to live quite well. In the course of time, of course, as uh, Jung 
uh, became better known in the world. Uh, people would come here from all over the world mm -hmm. to study with him through the 20s and 30s. Um, and he traveled quite a lot. He traveled to the United States, traveled to England, traveled all over Europe and other parts of the world. He became very famous. So it became like a movement. And when he broke away from Freud, there was already a group of people around him. And in, in psychoanalysis in the early years, he was the president of the Psychoanalytic International Psychoanalytic Association, IPA. He was the first president. And there were others in Zurich who uh, were practicing Freudian analysis and with Jung. And when he broke away, most of them came with him. Uh, and so this was called the Zurich School at first, the Zurich School of Psychoanalysis. And then he came up with the name analytical psychology to distinguish it from psychoanalysis. And uh, and he deepened that. He worked, you know, after, um, of course, in, from 1913 on through the 20s, he worked on the Red Book. So that was his self-experience. And out of that experience, he elaborated certain theories about, uh, about the psyche. And he became a very, you know... Um, famous and effective, uh, uh, charismatic teacher. And so this started a movement, and this was called the Zurich School of Analytical Psychology. And then in the 1940s, after the war, uh, Jungian Institutes started growing up. The first were in uh, Zurich in 1948, London, same year, I think New York, San Francisco, shortly after. And, and there were Jungians by that time in Israel and Italy and in uh, a number of European countries and North America. When the Institute was created, then people started coming here to study from all over the world, yeah. from Japan and uh, South America. They would study here and then go back and start schools there, analytical psychology movements in their own countries. So that's how the whole thing started on an international level. And in 1955, the International Association for Analytical Psychology was founded. And that's, uh, at that time, there were five or six groups in different countries. Now there are, I think, 40 uh, in all, on all the continents. And quite early on, uh, a, a, um, I would say a controversy started to form and then a, a, a differentiation between what was called the London School and the Zurich School. Mm -hmm. And the London School was was um, influenced most strongly by Michael Fordham, who uh, became very interested in what was going on in psychoanalysis with uh, Melanie Klein and a friend of his, Winnicott, uh, who became a famous psychoanalyst, and mm -hmm. there were a number of other people. And so the... Um, London School became a kind of hybrid between modern psychoanalysis, not so much Freudian, but these other later schools of psychoanalysis uh, that were taking root in London, uh, a hybrid between that and uh, Zurich mm -hmm. analytical psychology. And so their, their theory and their methods and their ways of practicing analysis went off in another direction. And so you got two schools. You had this called the developmental school, the London School, and then the Zurich School now became the classic school. And uh, today, Zurich continues, uh, at least at ISEP, the International School of Analytical Psychology in Zurich, uh, to train people in this method and this theory called the classical uh, yes. method of analytical psychology. What happened in Zurich was that there was a, a, a division, a, call it a split or a breaking away of a small group of analysts in the 90s who felt that uh, the Jungians here were at the, at the Jung Institute were becoming too much, changing too much, becoming too influenced by other theories and other directions. And so they wanted to kind of reverse the course and go back and reconstitute the Jungian movement as it had been in Jung's time, and their leader was Mary Louise von Franz. So she was kind of a the star of that school, the center of it until she died in the 90s. And they formed what was called what's called the Centrum, the center of I think it's called the center of Jungian psychology in the in the spirit of C.G. Jung and Mary Louise von Franz. And they have a training program. 
the Jung Institute tried to keep them within its uh, system, but they, they wanted to have their own, so they went in that way. And they emphasize certain features of analytical psychology that are included in all the schools, but they really give them a much stronger emphasis, and they exclude some things that have been added since Jung's time, some emphases on other matters. Uh, but they work very, very much with myths, fairy tales, uh, dream interpretation, active imagination. That's sort of the core of the classical approach yeah. uh, to uh, analysis. And then there was uh, in the in the late nineties, early two um, thousands, a much more severe split in the Jung Institute, uh, where um, a majority of the analysts left, and and the better known analysts left, and this was caused not so much by ideological differences as a a power conflict: who's going to run the institute and how's it going to orient itself. Mm-hmm within Swiss culture, and it got to be, um, you know, a very vituperative and a nasty exchange among uh, two groups of analysts. And the, the ones who left formed a new school called the International School of Analytical Psych, ISAP, we call it. Yes. Um, it, which now operates in Zurich. It just celebrated its 10th anniversary, and it's functioning very well and thriving. And as students from, I think, 25 countries, that's the one that I'm involved with. I moved over here in 2003, uh, back to Switzerland from the States. Uh, I had trained here in the 70s, early 70s, came back here 30 years later. And so I'm involved at that school. I teach there, and I'm a training analyst. The ones who stayed at the old Jung Institute in Kustak, it's located in a suburb of, of Zurich, where actually Jung's house is located. They... Um, had to had to change their teaching strategy because most of the students, the international students, left with the analysts. And so they set up what's called a block program. So you don't have to come and live in Switzerland. You can come here for two or three weeks, a couple times a year, and do most of your work at home. And that's very convenient for people who don't sure. have to pick up everything. It's, it's much less costly. They can keep their lives going uh, at home. And so that's been quite popular and successful. And and. I think ideologically and and uh, as far as theory goes, the two schools are quite similar. Mm-hmm. It's just that their uh, approaches to training are different. Oh, On the one side, it's called uh, total immersion. You yeah. come, you live here for at least two, two, three years. You can do some of your work at home after that, but you get sort of the total immersed Jungian experience here. And that has a certain value that you, that's irreplaceable because this is the home of Jungian psychology and you pick up culture, cultural features and, and, uh, experience Europe. And it's, it's very nice if you can afford it. The problem is financial, of course. Sure. And, and also just picking yourself up and leaving your home for a couple of years. And it's, it's like universities. You know, if you want to study at Oxford or yeah. Yale or something, you have to go there, you know, and study there. This other is a com- an accommodation to modern times. They use some, I think, Skype teaching methods, and, you know, long distance methods, which I think are okay, um, but it's it's not the same. So we've got three schools going in, okay. in Zurich, two with more or less the same ideological approach, and one that's we call them fundamentalists. I know them. I know them quite well. I respect them. I wouldn't want to go there because to me it's too narrow. I think what has happened in Jungian psychology is it did open to the world in a way that Jung couldn't in his time. I think in his time he was very open to the world, but the world was very different. And so a lot of new influences have come in, and and, uh, you get books like uh, very um, highly reputed and and very much used books like Donald Kalshad's books on trauma. And if you read his books, you can see how he blends a basic, fundamental Jungian approach with a lot of psychoanalytic uh, ideas and, uh, I would say, important uh, insights. And you get a, a weaving together of a kind of conglomerate of uh, Jungian and psychoanalytic approaches to discuss a theme that all psychotherapists have to deal with, trauma. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's very useful. And what he draws from other schools is also very useful. So I, 
I believe in that. I don't do it so much myself. I'm more an old-fashioned Jungian. Mm -hmm. And our school, ISAP, is really grounds itself in Jung's writings. So most of our teaching comes out of Jung's writings and a few of the other Jungians, like von Franz, of course, is very important. And now Erich Neumann is coming back into the picture yes. very strongly. Um, because the letters between Neumann and Jung were published last year. Mm -hmm. And so his work is being revived, and um, uh, I think there's sort of a Neumann uh, renaissance in the works. Very valuable. To some extent outdated, because he died in 1960, but he was a brilliant thinker. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I like about Jung's work, and I... I discuss this in the introduction to my book, uh, Jung's Map of the Soul, is that he didn't create a tight system. Tight systems, you know, like you get in philosophy, for instance, Hegel or some of these philosophers, they build really tight systems, and you climb into them, you learn them, they're fascinating, but then you're trapped in them. You know, they're too tight, and you can't think outside of them anymore. Mm -hmm. Jung had a set of ideas that are sort of systematic, or you know, you can you can say there is a structure to them. He, that's what I write about in Jung's Map of the Soul. He mapped the psyche in a very particular way, and he worked in it in a particular way. But he leaves openness to um, fresh insights, new ideas, and he didn't systematize in mm -hmm. a in a tight thinking function way. Mm -hmm. Now Neumann comes along and he bases himself on Jung and he systematizes. Mm -hmm. And so some people don't like that. But I think if you use these two together, and you don't take Neumann as a dogma, but as a way of extending some Jungian ideas into a meta-psychological uh, perspective, they're very interesting and very useful. Mm -hmm. So I like Neumann. But not without Jung. I ah, like them together. Right. <laughs> now, you go to Israel, and uh, they're Neumannians. I mean, they study Neumann more than Jung. Okay. And so they're a little too far on the ah, Neumann okay. side. You go over to the Zentrum here, they study von Franz a lot, but I think it's a little too uh, too narrow and too, um, I guess, introverted, introverted thinking, intuition, uh, they go deep, but they don't uh, seem to speak to this world very much, in my okay. in my feeling. They would say they do, but uh, <laughs> I think their their set of references are quite limited, and they're very past oriented, okay. very oriented toward the history of culture, yes. the deep history, Egypt, you know, Egypt, mm. Greece, the, the Near East, and the ancient times, alchemy, uh, which Jung also was. But I think they got stuck there in a way. That's that's my view. And I, I was, you know, very involved with Jungians internationally, uh, president of the IAP, and so on. So I traveled all over the world. I I know Jungians in every country, and each country and nationality has come up with its own, you know, slightly different variation mm -hmm. of Jungian psychology. And if you're in a large organization like that, you have to respect them all. It's yes. like an umbrella organization. So I listen to them all. I'm grounded in Zurich mm -hmm. and in and Jung's work, but mm -hmm. I can, uh, and I like to be open. I like to be open to them, hear them, think, well, there's something there. And I think that's what ISAP does too, pretty much. Uh, I know all the faculty people there. And they're, um, they each have their own individual interests and um, areas of expertise. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, the spirit is very good, and uh, it's very international, I think, more than uh, the Jung Institute faculty is. that They're more Swiss, German-speaking, okay. um, but they do bring in people from outside to teach mm -hmm. uh, in their international program. And then what about the Inter-Regional Society of Jungian Analysts in the, in the United States? Yeah. Oh, well, I was uh, one of the founding members of yes. it. It was formed in 1976, I think. It was a makeshift at first. It was meant to be uh, like a startup. You know, you get things going in various different centers between the continent, between the coasts, and the, because there were no training programs um, between uh, New York and San Francisco. So uh, the interregional was uh, an attempt to get things started in other places. There was a location in Dallas. I was in Houston at the time. Mm -hmm. 
June Singer was in Chicago. There, um, Bill Williford was in Seattle. Linda Leonard was in Denver. And so, uh, and we would meet once or twice a year and have training seminars and do analysis in these areas. And it, the idea was that as each area grew and developed, it would break off and become a separate uh, entity and mm -hmm. join the IAP as a as a training group on its own. Chicago did that. It was the first one to go out. I was there. I was the first president of Chicago in 1980. And, um, and then it sort of developed a life of its own. And it, it continued, and people from other institutes joined it. And it didn't do what it was supposed to do. So that was controversial. Okay. It was supposed to dissolve in time, but I it didn't. See. Instead, it grew and solidified, mm. still going yes. very strongly. Um, and I think it's done a good job. I mean, I know lots of the people in there. They, it has a good spirit. Uh, they've had some problems along the way, but, and I think now some, I think Denver uh, became separate as it should have done years and years ago. Um, and so maybe over time, this will actually happen. I don't know. What was a makeshift became a kind of permanent structure, and this happens sometimes. I'm very grateful to Dr. Stein for giving me an hour of his time that day, as well as to all of the people who helped put it together and get me there. Please visit the website speakingofjung.com for information about the books, places, and organizations that were mentioned during the interview, as well as for all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to listen to or download for free. The podcast is also available on iTunes and on Stitcher, and on the website you'll find links for those as well. I took a lot of photos in Zurich, and if you're interested, please follow me on Twitter at JungianLaura, where I'll be tweeting links to the blog posts and photo albums that I'll be uploading. So with special thanks to United Airlines, the Park Hyatt Zurich, and a bold and brash Swiss taxi driver who got me to Dr. Stein's in the nick of time, and with my eternal gratitude to Dick Sweeney, Sean Lau, Charlie Arthur, and Diane Braden. This is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung. <laughs>